Hello, I'm Hank Shade. This is another episode of the Buffalo Journal. Since the turn of the century, native artifacts have made their way to museums and private collections throughout the world. The Sixika Nation is bringing some of these long-lost artifacts back. Today, we take you to the Old Sun Museum. Also in this episode of the Buffalo Journal, a surprise for some of you rock and rollers. But first, like many Indian reserves, the Siksika Nation, east of Calgary, has made a rapid transition from the nomadic buffalo days to the modern age of high technology. The Siksika are making a smooth transition. The Blackfoot Nation, or in the Blackfoot language, the Siksika Nation, occupies 467 square miles with a population nearing 4,000. On September 22nd, 1877, the Siksika Nation, under Chief Crowfoot, signed Treaty 7 with Queen Victoria's representatives at Blackfoot Crossing. They gave the Queen title to over 50,000 square miles for a reserve and treaty rights. At about the same time the treaty was signed, the traditional way of life was destroyed by the advancement of white settlers. The Siksika became farmers and ranchers, and there are still some successful farming operations today. In the early 1900s, the missionaries, in cooperation with the Canadian government, built two residential schools. The cultural genocide has its devastating effects on the Siksika to this day. In response to past wrongs, a new and determined Siksika nation has started a rebuilding process. Chief Strader Crowfoot. We've been, in the past uh, several years, putting together an overall comprehensive plan for economic development, and uh, we are now following through with those plans. Uh, we've just finished building a strip mall, uh, about 10 stores in the strip mall. That's on the reserve. A uh, new administrative complex. Uh, we've just, uh, as well, in that project, uh, a small industrial building, which is completed. Uh, the shell stands and looking. We have a business in mind. We ha we've worked on it for five years. And we're just in the process of closing the financial uh, arrangement for it. There'll be a, a cup plant manufacturing uh, mugs and, and dinnerware. Um, we've uh, set up an industrial park, and we have a couple good leads for uh, bringing in clients to start that off. We've just uh, restructured our resort financially, and uh, we are going to use that money to leverage other developmental projects. Looking at a couple of tourism projects right now for that. Uh, we've uh, kind of, re we've, in our planning for economic development, we've restructured our, our, our organization tribally, uh, for the tribe as a whole and for economic development. And we feel that uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a good structure that's going to help us uh, move faster and quicker. Mm -hmm. We've spent the last three years uh, restructuring our administration and we feel we're at a point right now where it's uh, it's almost there. Like we've got setting up a treasury board function, uh, a treasury uh, group that's going to administer all the, the funds for the tribe. We have a land management taxation uh, thing that uh, it's in place. Um, we've uh, talking about culture as well. We've uh, reorganized our culture into one 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 department and uh, with the elders, the youth, historical sites, and, co and elders, culture, in that, uh, that, that one department. Another important element in the new Indian government initiatives is communications. Public works. A communication department was developed as a part of the administration. Director Wade LaFrance tells us the impact of the radio station is overwhelming. It's extremely positive. It's just um, unbelievable, I guess, is the best way to describe it. 
um, people are so fascinated with the idea of just turning on the radio and finding out what's happening on the reserve instead of through the old telegraph or the old moccasin telegraph method. And uh, you know how that goes. Information gets distorted as it goes along the line. But um, the information we get up here is straight from council chambers, so it's accurate and up to date. And when it's spoken in Blackfoot, that even gives it more uniqueness because um, the older people can relate to that. And with the language, um, the Blackfoot language not being spoken as much as it used to be, it's, it's reviving the language and people take notice of that. And I guess pride would have a lot, you know, they're proud to listen to someone telling them about what's happening on the reserve in their own town. Another element of political independence is an economic development base. Economic development officer Reynold Redcrow explains. To control economic development would be, would be the ideal thing, right? Because of the fact that um, we as, as native communities know what we require. Rather than, let's say, for example, the department saying, you know, we're controlling economic development. This is what you need. These are the kind of funding sources that you require. And, and go do it, right? Whereas if we had control, let's say in a sense, we would be able to do long-term planning, more or less, like let's say five-year planning, right? If you've got, in a sense, maybe let's say a five-year projections and cash flow, right? In, in, term, in a sense of, of looking at the funding sources, right? I guess the basis of, of looking at in the 90s or further is, is, is the, is the five-year plan, right? Like we had a, we've got a five-year plan and a mandate from chief and council to um, provide five, um, 200 full-time jobs within these five years. So there's other elements that you would have to look into that in order to get those jobs, right? Let's say, for example, um, the human resources, right? You'd have to get the different um, needs that the people require and their previous experiences and their levels of education, not only levels of education, but where they're at. And then you would go from there, then identify what their desires are, where they want to be. As the Sikshika enter the 90s, they have become leaders in Indian self-government, taking control of their own destiny. Next, coming home. Our visit to the Sikshika Nation took us to a rare native museum housed in an old boarding school called Old Sun after one of the prominent Blackfoot chiefs of the past. The museum is part of the cultural revitalization of Sikshika. Most of the artifacts in this collection come from the families of the Blackfoot who live here. Some of them are from private collections around the world. They represent centuries of native civilization. Taking care of these precious artifacts is left to the museum's curator, Russell Wright, himself a Blackfoot. He feels the nurturing of the old ways is part of Sikshika's plan for retaining their nationhood. The original purpose of the Blackfoot Museum was to preserve and maintain our treaty and Aboriginal rights, to teach about Sikshika tribal history, uh, and the cultural dynamics, to interpret to the dominant society authentic historical facts, and also to interpret, particularly to our young people, the least known aspects about the life of the Sikhika people. The Old Sun exhibit follows the course of history from the Stone Age to the Modern Age, Artifacts such as ancient hammers and other primitive utensils of the Blackfoot are displayed in the Stone Age exhibit. This ancient dog travoy 
is a rare piece in the collection. Small as the early dogs were, they carried their master's belongings with the travoy tied to its back. This early mode of transportation by the Plains Indians lasted for centuries until the arrival of the horse. A more elaborate means of transportation was developed, as we can see by these saddles used during the late 19th century. It's approximately uh, 600 pieces of uh, historic uh, material specimens. And we do own uh, a few of our own through collections, through donations, through gifts. We have uh, approximately 800 uh, uh, different specimens of artifacts for sea. And um, <clears throat> we hope to, in the next phase of our development, uh, to um, <clears throat> Do much more than just display the artifacts. Uh, we hope to get into intensive cataloging and documentation so that uh, our young people and others who, in, who show interest in the historic facts, in the material culture of our people, as well as the artistic cultures. And <clears throat> if they do so desire to look into the uh, spiritual cult of our people, that is the ceremonies and, and the sacred bundles. Uh, all this can be arranged through uh, specific uh, programs. Although many of the pieces in the Old Sun Museum lay dormant, there is a plan to revitalize the Sikshka culture by using some of the religious ceremonial articles which we were not allowed to show. The Sikshka are looking for the old ways in a sense, many of these artifacts have made it back home, closer to their origins. In recent times, <clears throat> there has been um, a great deal of discussion on, the, um, on matters relating to uh, uh, sacred bundles, or as they call them, medicine bundles. Um, to those of us native people involved in the anthropology and now archaeology and uh, into Indian museums and whatever other cultural historical institutions. Uh, the new people that are trained in, in museology, that is native people, uh, have come to the conclusion that uh, the sacred bundles are not really artifacts. They're still very functional with the return of the spiritual, cultural values of the um, Indian people of this region. Um, we may not see too many of them. We may not spe have specific uh, sacred bundle displays. We think that they're still functional Therefore, uh, the elders should have the, the final say-so as to how they're going to be uh, used in Indian museums or other historical institutions. The Old Sun Museum houses one of the few native-run exhibits in Canada. By bringing these artifacts back to their original owners, the Sikhika are ensuring their heritage is being preserved for future generations to see. Coming up next, Indian rock and roll. For many years, contemporary native music has always been on the back burner in the mainstream of the music industry. The music of Buffy St. Marie in the late 60s paved the way for native talent and inspired many to pursue the same path. Now, as we enter the 90s, a new group of native artists has taken the same road, Kinrock, 
a rock and roll group from the Blood Reserve, have been playing their brand of music since they started back in 1979. The Buffalo Journal spoke with vocalist Lance Tailfeathers. He tells us of his songwriting and how the group got started. So it was 1978-79. Great 12 was just running out of time. Graduation day was coming up. People say, Lance, what are you going to do? But in my high school years, I was always fascinated with rock and roll. I mean, I couldn't find more energy in a vehicle and the way it connected and moved a mass amount of people. I'm talking numbers. My native culture has played a very important part of me as progressing as, a, as an artist and basically as a person. It's made me understand harmony, understand enjoying what we call now the lesser things in life, but really they're more important to what's really taken over because look at this whole environment issue now. One of the more successful songs of my songwriting career is a piece I called Rainmaker. Now above line, above the fine line at normal, it's a cry out for approval, being thrown aside, I guess your basic love story, and the saying goes, you don't really know what you have until it's gone, more or less hoping that maybe you can draw from that. But the native perspective behind Rainmaker is remembering how the earth is in its natural naked beauty. Anyway 
I'm proud of who I am and what I am and where I've come from. It's just that this time zone and this decade has portrayed it differently, and I can't really dwell on that. So I'm going to proceed. I'm going to keep climbing with this, and I'm going to keep struggling and struggling. And yes, I've become very business-oriented because I've had to do this all by myself over the years. I hope that I can control that side of me because uh, I've seen a lot of people fall through it. At the same time, maintain myself as this aspiring music writer, this native music writer, and reflecting my culture and sharing some of its ideas and ideology, and sharing some of its ideology with the rest of this world. Last time on the Buffalo Journal, we asked you this question. A freeway in Calgary is named after a famous Indian marathon runner. Who was this person? Deerfoot was a Blackfoot runner who could run from the Sixka Nation to Fort McLeod and back in one day, a total of 450 kilometers. He worked for the Northwest Mounted Police as a courier during the late 19th century. The Deerfoot Trail was named after him. Today's trivia question is this. How many Aboriginal languages are there in Canada? That's another episode of the Buffalo Journal. Hope you have enjoyed it. Until next time, this is Hank Shade. <laughs>